Let's not waste any time. I know why you're here. You want to learn the correct way to cut a sandwich. Now unfortunately, this is not a question with a simple answer or a simple explanation. For the purposes of this discussion, we will primarily compare the diagonal cut and the vertical cut on bread sandwiches. Now, there are some people who will tell you that it doesn't actually matter. These people will tell you that it's the same amount of sandwich, so there isn't actually a real difference, just a preference or an illusion. These people are wrong. There is a small but demonstrable difference in the mass of these two sandwiches. Now, let's take a quick back to a high school physics class, right? While you're told to just ignore friction like 80% of the time, you hopefully know that you can't actually do this in the real world. The second law of thermodynamics states that, among other things, nothing is completely 100% efficient. There are always inefficiencies everywhere. Always a little bit of friction, always something that can't be put back into place or reversed perfectly. And, and in physics class, this generally just means like, oh, that crate's not actually going to slide at a constant speed. But for our purposes today, it means that the knife cannot possibly cut the sandwich without removing a portion of its mass. And all of this is for a series of reasons, but the first one is viscosity. This is a material property where a fluid sticks to itself or other surfaces. It illustrates the difference between pouring out a cup of water and pouring out a cup of honey. Now you may be thinking, hey dumbass, bread isn't a fluid. What if my sandwich doesn't have a liquid on it? I only eat turkey sandwiches with no condiments. Lame. And while you may be right, it doesn't change that bread is still viscoelastic. And while this may be overly reductive, virtually every non-gas substance exhibits some degree of viscoelasticity. This word is a hybrid of the words viscous, which alludes to the fluid property viscosity, earlier mentioned, and elasticity, which refers to the tendency for solids to spring back into their original shape. The turkey on your sandwich, or the cheese, perhaps peanut butter, maybe pickles if you're a sicko, all exhibit viscoelasticity. This means that some mass will always exit the sandwich and cling to the knife. Now you may be thinking again, Hey dumbass, what if my sandwich is just two pieces of dry stale bread with nothing in between? Well in this case, the same frictional effect still applies. Even if 0% of the bread clings to the knife, which is impossible, then the fracture will cause crumbs to fall off the sandwich. Either way, we can establish that mass has left the sandwich. Now you may be wondering as you watch this, Hey dumbass, what's it matter if both sandwich cuts take out the same amount of mass? And this is where we must consult solid mechanics for an answer to our problem. I have shown here the equations for the strain tensor and the stress tensor of a deforming piece of bread. You can think of stress as a pressure exerted on the bread by the cutting of the knife, and you can think of strain as the amount, of, the amount that the bread deforms from this pressure, kind of like a rubber band stretching out from a force. Furthermore, we can use Maxwell's model for viscoelastic deformation to see the way the bread responds to the stress of the knife, but even this is incomplete without understanding the nature of ductile deformation. And while another model exists that places the viscous effect and elastic effect in parallel, my series assumption here is consistent with the gluten starch matrix which makes up bread. We'll talk more about that later. Now you may be thinking again, hey dumbass, speak English, to which I'll say no. Finding the correct sandwich cut is far too important a task for us to just take it easy. Now the curve shown here is a classic representation of a ductile materials deformation. During the first part of the curve, where it is linear, the bread undergoes elastic deformation. An increasing force causes an increasing stretch, but it will spring back into place when the force is removed. If you go beyond the elastic limit, where it stops being linear, we begin permanently stretching the bread. This process continues until necking, and eventually the bread tears away from itself. In order to cut the sandwich, you must achieve this breaking point. Otherwise, uh, it won't cut. Now you may be wondering, Hey dumbass, I only eat sandwiches made of brittle bread. It's not ductile at all. An answer to this quandary requires an intimate knowledge of bread. 
It can be safely modeled as a porous cellular solid with air pockets distributed through the crumb and crust. Bread has these cell walls made of a gluten starch matrix, and this provides the elastic and stretchy nature of bread. But at the same time, as I mentioned before, bread is intrinsically porous. If there is no low moisture content, uh, the bread will break into crumbs under the knife's application. If there is high moisture content, such as jelly softening the bread, then it will become the ductile uh, material we talked about. It will cling to the knife. So whether it's dry or wet, uh, it's still going to lose mass. So the moral of the story is that it does not matter if the porosity plasticizes the bread. In either case, the mere act of cutting the sandwich will cause a decrease in the sandwich's overall mass. Now, you may be thinking again, hey dumbass, that didn't answer my question. What's it matter if both sandwiches lose the same amount of mass? An answer to your question requires a simple connection. The loss of mass is ultimately caused by the breakage in the, br the bread. The bread's breakage is caused by a high strain, which requires a high stress. This stress was applied by a knife uh, through shearing or penetrative contact, which we can model as a frictional or normal force, respectively. Now, why does this matter? Well, the work we mentioned before, that work equals force times distance. Just as you uh, use more energy by applying the knife over a longer cut, the mass removed from the sandwich is directly proportional to the length of the cut. Put simply, a longer cut means the knife took more mass from the sandwich. Now you may be asking, hey dumbass, both ways of cutting would slice the sandwich in half. Doesn't that mean both cuts are the same length? Which, uh, kind of embarrassing, but to answer that, you would need to think back to your fifth grade math class. By implementing Pythagorean theorem, we can safely conclude that the diagonal cut is longer, because it is the hypotenuse of the right triangle. Since a vertical cut is simply equal to the rectangle's height, that leg of the triangle will always be shorter than the diagonal. For example, let's say that your bread is a square with side length 10. The vertical cut would be 10 inches long, but the diagonal would be 14.1 inches long, meaning it shaves off an extra 41% of the mass. Now, let's try to summarize what we've covered. The vertical cut sandwich has a shorter length cut, and that's because of Pythagorean theorem. The shorter cut means that less mass is removed from the sandwich by the knife's viscoelastic shearing. Because less mass is removed, we can confidently conclude that the vertical cut sandwich has more mass and wastes less food. Now you may be thinking again, hey dumbass, why isn't this video over? Didn't you just say the answer? Well, it may be somewhat more subject subjective than this. While the vertical cut gives a sandwich more mass, the diagonal cut does have some advantages of its own. We do need to talk about those. I might even run through some proxy calculations at the end of this video. We'll see. So look at this diagram. While we've established that the vertical sandwich has more mass, the same cannot be said for the perimeter. The diagonal sandwich has a total perimeter of 24 inches, whereas the vertical sandwich has a perimeter of only 20 inches. Not only this, but let's focus on those extra inches. They're located in the most important part of the sandwich. Not only is the cut part of the sandwich crustless, but it also exposes more of the sandwich contents to the air. This will improve the scent and the overall eating experience, as well as just maximizing the number of bites you can take without hitting crust. So this means that the diagonal sandwich has more surface area than the vertical sandwich, despite having less mass. That extra surface is also in a higher quality part of the sandwich. Now you might just think to yourself, hey, what would happen if we cut the sandwich again? We established earlier that a longer cut removes more mass from the sandwich, and that's still true. If we cut the sandwich into four pieces as shown, then we lose twice as much mass as we normally would. However, this would further incre increase the surface area of each segment. We could continue this process if we wanted. Into eights, into sixteens, almost infinitely. 
if we ignore the second law of thermodynamics. But it's because of that second law that we lose mass every time we do this. If we continued this process, we would continuously sacrifice mass for surface area until eventually there would hardly be any mass left. Now, all of this resembles a fractal called the Menger sponge, or maybe Menger, I have no clue. It's a, ship, a shape created by iteratively and infinitely cutting out the center of each square surface. It's a cool concept, but not very useful if you're just trying to enjoy a sandwich. In the end, the correct method does actually come down to personal preference, although we do have some math explaining the advantages of each one. We can say with certainty that the vertical cut leaves more of the sandwich, whereas the diagonal cut gives more surface area. But then, if surface area is all that you care about, why would you stop at just one cut? The choice is yours. Alright, now to further illustrate my point, I want to use Microsoft Excel just to get some dummy values in, uh, to illustrate exactly how much uh, mass we're going to lose for each sandwich cut. And furthermore, we can also calculate the surface area benefit for each cut that we lift upon the sandwich. So, first, we're just going to make up some values. Let's do bread width, uh, bread length, and bread thickness. And we'll, we'll just say that the unit for all this is measured in inches. So... Not that it really matters, because all of this is proportional anyways, but it's always good to keep track of your units. So, let's say the sandwich width is, uh, that is, uh, the height, I guess, of the bread. We can say that's probably reliably about 4.4 .4 inches. I'm sure it uh, varies with the piece of bread, of course. Uh, the length seems to be a little bit longer, maybe 5 inches or so. And lastly, for the bread thickness, I'd say we could probably, because it's two pieces of bread stacked on top of each other, with something in between, we don't really know what the in-between thing is, but because this is all proportional, it doesn't actually matter. So I'm going to go ahead and say 2.2 .2 inches for this one. So that's just the amount of uh, the, the side lengths, the dimension lengths for the bread. What we could consider next is the density of the bread. Uh, that way we can actually calculate the mass. So, say, uh, density measured in, so we could do pounds per square inch, or cubic inch, no mistake. I'm much more familiar with kilogram per meter cubed, but that's all right, it doesn't actually matter. So, let's see, the density per cubic inch, I'd say probably if you have a cubic inch of a sandwich, the weight of that's probably around 0 0.1 pounds. Uh, is that accurate? Yeah, probably not. But it doesn't matter, because again, this is all proportional. So, what we want to consider right now is the completely uncut sandwich. Alright, and what we can do here is make a column for the mass of the uncut sandwich. Uh, in case you're looking at this and you're thinking, wow, this guy really does not know Microsoft Excel. Yeah, you're right. It, it's been a while. Anyways, uh, what I'm going to use here, because mass is the density of the sandwich times the volume, what we can pretty reliably do is take the volume of the sandwich, which is C1 times C2 times C3, and then we can just multiply that by whatever density we choose for the sandwich. And again, this number is completely arbitrary, yes, but because it's proportional, it, it, all, it all comes full circle in the end. So... That's the mass of the uncut sandwich. Now, furthermore, uh, we'd be amiss if we didn't get the perimeter around it. Oh, and you, you guys can see now why I say that my uh, density is way off, because 4.84 pounds, hopefully you're not eating a sandwich that's almost 5 pounds, because that's, that's insane. So, 
maybe let's uh, lower that a little bit. That's probably a little more realistic. Anyways, I'm, I'm mostly just familiar with SI units, but this is fine. So, I want to get the perimeter around the sandwich. Stretch this out a little bit. Uh, and then, of course, the surface area of the sandwich. And, uh, see, there I went again. I default to saying perimeters in meters, but it's not in meters. Perimeter in inches. And here, the surface area will be in square inches. Alright, so the total perimeter around the sandwich, uh, assuming that it's roughly rectangular, we can say 2 times C1 plus 2 times, oh, that's not the plus sign, plus 2 times C2. And because the perimeter just has some width to it, the surface area is going to be as simple as taking D6. Uh, that is the perimeter, and multiplying it by the thickness of the sandwich. So, we have here the mass, perimeter, and surface area of our uncut sandwich. Alright, but now what we need to do is think about the cut length on the sandwich. That is the vertical cut. And in order to do this, I'll probably have to move all these down a little bit. So, shift cells, right? Yeah, that's not quite how I envisioned that going, but, but that's okay. That's alright. Or that. This is fantastic. As you guys can tell, it has been, it has been a while. Okay, so we have the uncut sandwich. Um, we, we should get the length of the cut in inches, of course. And for the uncut sandwich, that'll just be zero. However, for the cut sandwich, let's say the vertical cut, here's what we need to consider. Uh, the length of the cut is just going to be equal to the width of the bread, because uh, that's how a vertical cut works, it minimizes the actual cut distance. So, whatever value is in C1 will be the vertical cut. And the mass here, the mass admittedly is just going to be the D6 value. Uh, however, what we need to consider is not just the uh, total mass here, but we need to consider that we're losing some cut length. Oh, we're going to have to come back to this one, actually. Uh, I don't want D9 in here. Because one thing we didn't consider, so this is going to be wrong for right now. What we need to consider is how much mass gets lost on each cut, or at least what percentage of mass. So say portion of mass loss. And this is just going to be a ratio, there's no units for a ratio. I would say it's probably reasonable to assume that whether you're losing mass on the sandwich by cutting off some crumb, or uh, you're losing mass because of the jelly or whatever sticking to the knife, in either case, you're probably losing maybe a tenth of a percent, if even. So, I'll just use a tenth of a percent here, and all we have to do now is take the D6 value, that is the total mass of the uncut sandwich, and if we say that we're losing, yeah, th 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 this is how much we're losing per inch, so this is probably even lower than this, come to think of it. So, we'll say portion of mass loss per inch of cut. Alright, so what we can do now is say, alright, we're
we're losing that much. Times the value in H3. Oh. Sorry for all the trouble here. Probably could have scripted this through, but I'm lazy as all hell, so that's just not happening. And then we'll go with C7 on that. Alright, so you can see there's a very small change in mass here. To be honest, this is kind of a larger... No, no, no. This looks right. From 968 to 9675. That, that looks about accurate. However, the perimeter on the vertical cut is going to be a bit different. Uh, this is because now that we've opened up the middle part, what we want to consider is that the middle crustless part is basically going to add some extra widths to, to our arrangement. So instead of having two widths on the left end and right end, we're going to have four because the left end, the middle, the other middle, and the right end. So... There we go. 4 times C1 plus 2 times C2. So length overall is unaffected. Uh, surface area, just the same formulation. Oh, okay. Yeah, we, we just needed to give some uh, dollar signs to the C3 here so it'll stay in place. There we go. So we can see how that affects the surface area of the sandwich, as well as the perimeter. And let's say you want to have a crustless distance. Like, you, you just want to know the uh, crustless surface area. So, for the uncut sandwich, that's just going to be zero. For the vertical cut sandwich, if you're just trying to figure out how much surface area do you get that has no crust on it at all, that's going to be the two insides. So 2 times the length, or not the length, the width. And I'll, uh, I'll clarify that this is in square inches. Oh, not only that, this is just a perimeter that I have right now. We also need to multiply by the thickness of the bread. So that's the true surface area. So almost a third of the surface area is crustless, which is nice. Uh, a little surprising, now that I think about it. Huh? Oh, what can you do? So, let's move on then. We've got the diagonal cut. And unfortunately, the length of the cut is a little more complicated on this one, because we need to do a Pythagorean theorem. Uh... I'm going to make this look a little bit more like distance formula, so just be prepared for that. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to start with the value for C3, sorry, for C1. And I'm going to square it by having it multiply against itself. Then I'm going to add that to uh, C2 squared. Because we're looking for the hypotenuse right now. So I have here my a squared, I've got my b squared. And then I'm just going to take the square root of that. Okay, and we get here the length of the diagonal cut. You guys can see it's quite a bit different than the length uh, of a vertical cut. So, nothing too terribly shocking here, I don't think. So now let's go on to the mass. Uh, the mass is going to work the same as above, but now you can see we have lost even more mass. We went from 9675 to 9673. Small, but noticeable difference. Actually, it's not noticeable, but it does matter. So, next we want the perimeter. So, perimeter for this one is going to be 2 times C1. Uh, that's going to be the width on either side. All right, and then of course, we're gonna have two times the length, because those parts didn't just go away. But now we've opened up a middle cut, 
and that's the diagonal, which is C8. And you guys can see this largely increases the perimeter, which, of course, is going to largely increase the surface area as well. But the big change is going to be the crustless surface area. And I probably could have... Th there's probably a way to keep this consistent for each of them, because the crustless surface area is the cut, not necessarily C1, but the length cut column from before. So that didn't change the crustless surface area, but when we go to the diagonal cut, you can see there's quite an enormous difference here. And then of course we can uh, just continue this process, as in if we're cut into pores, Alright, and if we're cut into force, because we're just uh, taking the same diagonal and doubling it, what we can put here is we've got 2 times C8. This mass is pretty much the same thing. The same exact concept. The same with this perimeter. The same with this surface area over here. And now there's a couple interesting differences here, but you guys can hopefully see that we are increasing the perimeter and the surface area and the crustless surface area pretty drastically with each cut. And the only sacrifice is a little bit of mass. And we could hypothetically keep this up for a long time. Um, instead of doing 2 times C8 here, if you consider the diagonal getting cut again when you're put into force, pretty safely say that we're doing 4 times whatever C8 is. Alright, and you can see how the mass continuously decreases. So, eventually, eventually you can uh, do this iteratively, you can do this infinitely if you want, but it's just going to sort of make a mess here. Because like, for instance, let's say if we cut into, uh, I don't know, let's say we cut it into 256 pieces. Alright, so if we're doing that, uh, this would basically be the cut length here from the diagonal cut, but as far as I'm aware that would be 128 times the length. Uh, the reason I say that, and I haven't really formulated it out, it's also extremely late where I am right now, but what we can say here is when we cut into fours, we had to double the diagonal. When we cut into eights, we had to quadruple the diagonal. So the pattern seems to be just however many pieces you cut it into divided by two. So 128 times C8. Nope, that's not the multiply button. All right, so that's the length of the cut. Let's see what that does to the mass. Okay, pretty noticeable change on the mass. And that's the thing, in reality, I think it'd be an even bigger difference than that. But that's not the point. Well, got an issue with the perimeter, apparently. C, C3. Oh, yep, there was a mistake back here. I apologize, everybody. So the uncut sandwich, of course, was just double C1, double C2, and just sort of combined. And the vertical cut, uh, again, we, we basically just took two times the length of the cut and combined those. But here, what I needed to do is take the dollar sign, 
or C1. That's not the dollar sign. Part of it being very late is that I have absolutely no light and can barely see the computer. So, C1, C2, and C8 is the only thing that should be changing. This is going to change the, param the perimeter, no doubt. On this one as well. And this one as well. Alright, you guys can see how that increases the crust of surface area by a considerable margin, uh, as well as the total surface area. Perimeter, mass, cut. We could keep this up for a while. Now, let's say I'm completely wrong about one of these lengths, because I'm just guessing at the moment. But let's say the width is 3.2. Yeah, all the numbers change, but the winners the winners don't change. The vertical cut still has the most mass, no matter how you change the dimensions up here. And the larger cutted uh, bread is always going to have more surface area, no matter how I mess with these numbers up here. I can change them all around, and yeah, all the numbers will change pretty considerably as a result, but in the end, it doesn't really make that much of a difference. Oh, you can see here if I change this, we barely have any mass left when we got into 256. So, hopefully you guys kind of see what I'm going at here. Um, the point is, mass is always going to decrease as you cut the sandwich more. However, the surface area is going to increase as you cut the sandwich more. So hopefully this has been a useful explanation. And again, sorry for all the trouble here in this part of the video. Um, I should do a second take for the